Welcome back to the 28th episode of The Crossroads, a weekly financial show for our generation. And for listeners, welcome back to the Long Game Podcast. This week, we are back on our own, and we are talking about everyone's absolute favorite topic, taxes. Last, or I guess a couple episodes ago, we hit on crypto taxes with Jamin Desai, the founder of Reconcile Money. Um, and then that kind of got us thinking more about taxes, like how we can help out. So we wrote a 16 page, like ultimate tax guide to really understand everything you need to know about taxes. Like as a young professional, like we hit on income taxes, capital gains, like credits and deductions to try and lower your tax bill, all that sort of stuff. So we're just going to kind of walk through that today. And if you want to get a copy of it, you can grab that at allstreetwealth.com slash tax guide. And then we're also going to be sending out um, a monthly newsletter, which will include like a new guide every month. So in April, we're going to have a health insurance guide. Um, We're going to have like a guide to investing, um, equity comp, all that sort of stuff, like every month. Um, And that'll get delivered straight to your inbox. So that's that's kind of what we got going on, and we're going to dive into the guide. Yeah, so uh, we're going to try to talk about a bunch of things today, and again, I think if you check out the guide, it'll be more helpful because we have examples and tables and numbers, but we're going to still try to get through everything so you guys have a basic understanding of income taxes, capital gains taxes, um, how various investment accounts are taxed, and then kind of the difference between tax credits, tax deductions, and some common ones that you can use. So I think at the most basic point, we have to start with income tax. I think this is like everybody understands it. Well, not everybody understands it. Everybody understands they have to pay income tax and we all hate paying income tax. And I know business owners hate it even more because we have to actually watch that money go into our account and then move it over versus W-2 employees who kind of get it, just have it withheld. Definitely a better feel. But when we're starting with income tax, I think the first thing that needs to be noted is that we have a progressive tax system. What that means is that taxes change as your income goes up. So not everybody pays 10% or 12% or 22 or 24. What happens is that it's based on your income is how much you get taxed. But the next step of it is what really confuses people is also that taxes are marginal. So that means like, if you look at the tax brackets, if you made $100,000 and you're a single person, that's a 24% tax rate, but you aren't taxed at 24% on all of your income you have from zero to 9,950, you have a 10% tax. And then you have 12% from about 10,000 to 40. And then 22 from 40 to 86. So what happens is like that first 10,000 of income is 10%. So you basically have $1,000 of tax on your first 10,000. Then that 12% for the next 30,000 ends up being you pay about $3,600 of tax on that spot. So what happens is everybody thinks that you like, okay, great, I make 100,000. That means I'm taxed at 24% which it really only means that your last dollar that's in those brackets are taxed at 24%. But really what happens and what's most important is finding that effective tax rate. And so the effective tax rate is what is the average amount of tax that I paid um, as I fill out those, as I fill each bracket. So I kind of want to stop there. I know that's like a lot to cover and you can kind of chime in on maybe a couple of things I, I skipped over. Yeah. And I mean, like the the marginal tax, like I didn't even learn that until like my junior, senior year of college. It might have even been like after graduation, because like whenever, like a few months ago, like last year, they were talking about, oh, raising the tax rate. If you make like, I think it was like over 500,000 or whatever it was. And like a lot of people are freaking out, like, oh, I'm going to owe so much more in tax. It's like kind of a little bit like if you like if you made 500,000 and the tax went up to like 50% if you made over 500,000 if you made $500,000 or 500,000 and $1 you would only owe 50% tax on that $1 like all the rest before it would still be the same which that was that last part that you were hitting on like that effective tax rate like your overall like it's never going to be whatever that very top marginal one is it's always going to be lower than that since it is progressive. Exactly. I think that's one thing most, almost very few people understand and like kind of walking through an example and using that hundred thousand dollar number. So the numbers I just talked about, so your first 9,950, you're at 10%. So you pay $995. Then from about that 10,000 to 40, you're at 12. So if you do the math, that's another $4,600 in tax. Then from 40 to 86,000, you're at 22%. That ends up getting you just under 15,000 in tax. And then that last 
little bit from 86,000 to 100,000, you have $14,000 that gets taxed at 24%. So if you add that all together, like most people would sit here and say, okay, hey, make 100,000, that's 24, I owe $24,000 of tax. But when you really do the math, at $100,000, you pay $18,000 of tax. So you end up with that effective tax rate of 18%, not 24, which is why I feel like that effective number is better because it gives you a true understanding of how much total tax did I pay, not how much tax will I pay on each additional dollar that I have coming in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then um, I think we should probably hit on the credits and deductions before the capital gains, um, just since that's kind of yeah. tied to... Um, uh, what was I just about income tax a little bit. Um, so yeah, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Okay. So the difference between a tax deduction and a tax credit is actually really big. I feel like people kind of just assume that all of them are tax credits when all reality it's not. So what a tax deduction is, is it basically reduces your taxable income today. So if you make a hundred thousand dollars and you have $5,000 tax deduction, your taxable income goes from a hundred thousand to 95. So it's not that you save $5,000 on tax, you save $5,000 plus that marginal tax bracket. So that 22%, so 5,000 times or times by 24%, sorry, ends up being $1,200. So the deduction is reduces taxable income today, multiply it by your tax rate. And that's how much you truly do end up saving on taxes for that. Yeah. And those are whenever you hear someone talk about like write offs or writing off income deductions or what they're talking about when they're. Yeah. So your 401k is like any retirement account, any pre tax retirement account specifically. That's exactly how those work. And mm -hmm. then tax Bridge interest, all that sort of stuff. Exactly. And then tax credits are kind of like the little bit of the superior one. So say we have $1,000, $100,000 of income still, $5,000 tax credit. It means there's no reduction today. So 100,000 times by, you know, we, you basically figure out that effective tax, which was 18%. So let's say you end up owing $18,000 of tax. That $5,000 tax credit is a dollar for dollar reduction from your tax bill you owe. So instead of now owing 18,000, you owe 18,000 minus the $5,000 tax bracket for a total of $13,000. So tax deduction that, that ended up being about 1200. The tax credit gave you actually $5,000 difference on your taxes. $3,800 difference is huge, but you have to understand the difference bet between the two because it's not like you necessarily get to choose. You're not like, hey, I get to use this as a tax credit versus a deduction. There's just tax credits that are out there and there's tax deduction deductions that are out there and you want to figure out how to best use them for your situation. Yeah, you can't do like, you can't just like write off random expenses and then choose to categorize it as a credit. Like the most common one recently has been like the child tax credit and then yeah. you need to qualify for those and then get those applied. And then that would lower your overall yeah. tax bill. So some common ones that we talked about, you talked about the child tax credit. We have like credit for other dependents. We have earned income tax credit, retirement contribution savings credit. But to be honest, there's way less credits than deductions. But the one thing that we haven't talked about with um, credits is that there's a difference between refundable tax credits and non-refundable tax credits. So basically what happens is like when you have a refundable tax credit, that means if your tax bill goes below zero where the IRS owes you money. So let's say the example we had before, you owed $2,000 on taxes, but now we have a $5,000 tax credit meaning you have a minus $3,000 tax bill. If ta the tax credit is refundable, you get that $3,000 back. But then there are some tax credits which are non-refundable, which means even if you have 5,000, it can only get to you to zero. It can't get you below zero where the IRS owes you money. And I don't think many people know that that even exists, but it is a very important thing to understand that you, you won't be getting that extra money back if it's non-refundable. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. So then I think we go back now to capital gains taxes. Yeah. So, and 
those are going to be huge this year and probably last year as well, just with all the trading that happened during, during the pandemic, more people getting invested for the first time, more younger people kind of entering the workforce and getting invested for the first time. Um, so the, the first one we want to hit on is short-term capital gains. So they're well, short-term. Let's, let's stop and just explain where capital gain comes from for the people that don't understand that. Yeah, so so capital gains happen when you're invested and you and that investment goes up in price, you sell it and then you have a gain. So if you bought a stock for $10, sold it for 15, you'd have a $5 capital gain. And you can also have capital losses. So if you bought something for 10, sold it for 5, you'd have a $5 capital loss. And then those can either be short-term or long-term gains or losses. So if you bought something on January 1st and sold it within 12 months, you would owe short-term gains. And yeah. those are taxed at ordinary income rates, um, just like we mentioned earlier, like the 10, 12, 22, 24. And then if you bought something and held it for longer than a year, it gets way more favorable rates um, at long-term capital gains. Um, so those that's just kind of like the basic intro to it. Like definitely know those two distinctions for sure. Yeah. I think it is actually really important to know um, because as you said, the short-term capital gains rates, you are taxed higher. So long-term capital gains rates are 0%, 15 or 20. And very few people are hitting that 20% amount because I would have to check, but I'm pretty sure the number is four, above 400. For yeah. a married pile jointly, it's 517,000. For single, it's 460. So you want to be aware of this because you don't want to only hold investments based on a time frame at all. Like that's not investment advice. You, you, you choose based on how, what you want to do with the investment, not solely based on taxes, but let's say you've been holding an investment for, you know, 11 and a half months and you're at the 32% tax rate, your high income. Like if you wait another month or two and sell it, you move down from 32 to 15% tax, like 17%. If this is a big investment, could make a huge difference. So I think it really is important to note that you don't make investment decisions based on taxes, but you should still be aware of the taxes because what happens, and especially in crypto, we hear this all the time, is that people are regularly trading. And so you can be trading a lot, making good money, not holding that money for taxes and have a $100,000 tax bill, but now all of that money has just been reinvest reinvested into a different investment that maybe is down 30%. And so now you don't have the money to to pay for the taxes, you don't want to sell that investment because it's really low and you can kind of get yourself in some, some sticky situations if you're not aware of what tax you're going to owe because you should be saving for that every single time. Yeah. And I mean, I think just like being aware of it is like the most important thing because you you have to hold the taxes whenever you sell and there's a gain just like a self-employed person because if not, you're you, like you said, you're going to have to sell investments in the future, um, like next tax season to pay that tax bill. Um, so definitely, I mean, whenever you're investing, like know, know what you're doing, know the short term, the long term kind of time frames. And I, I recommend like working with a CPA if you're not sure um, kind of what you're doing on that end. Like they it can be expensive, but that that's an investment as well. Like they will, if they're a good CPA, they will be well worth that, that time and money. 100%. Okay. So the last thing that we want to hit on is taxes based on the type of an investment account you use. So we really want to break this into three buckets. So the first one's Roth. So the, all that Roth means is after tax. I think when I say like Roth 401k to people, people just hear Roth and they think Roth IRA. They don't realize there's like Roth solo 401ks. There's Roth 401k, there's Roth IRA. All Roth means is after tax dollars. So what happens is, okay, hey, I make $100,000 and I've, I'm putting 6% in my Roth 401k. So that 6% comes in after tax. So it doesn't reduce my taxable income today, but then that money grows tax deferred. And then you basically get to pull out those earnings tax free as well in the future. So you never pay tax on those dollars again, based on the current system. That's what Roth is. So post-tax income goes in, never pay tax on those dollars again. Then we have the traditional bucket. So the traditional bucket is traditional IRA, regular 401k, 403b, um, et cetera. And with these accounts, you put in pre-tax dollars. 
So if I make 100,000 and I put that 6% into my 401k, now my taxable income goes down to 9,400. It's that tax deduction we talked about before. So 24% tax rate times $6,000 deduction ends up saving you like a little over $2,000 on taxes today. That's great. We, we all love reducing our tax bill, but what you have to be aware of is then that money is going to grow and then you're going to be able to pull out those earnings, but they're going to be deferred. So you're going to pay tax at your income rate when you pull that money out in the future. So if you're somebody that's like, hey, I'm making a ton of money today, I'm going to be having less income in retirement. You would much rather use these traditional buckets because you'd rather lower your tax at the, high, at the higher rate, pay it lower rate in the future. For Roth, if you, the people who want to use Roth are, hey, I'm at a, a low income bracket today and I'm going to pay tax at a higher rate most likely in the future. So I would much rather pay tax today with, through the Roth bucket than in the future in retirement when I'm going to be in a higher bracket. And then the last one is a brokerage account or a taxable investment account. And the great thing about these are they offer more liquidity. So with your Roth IRA, you can always pull out your contributions, but basically all the other accounts you can't pull out without paying taxes and a penalty. Um, so the thing is, you're like, okay, these are really great for retirement. You know, we can trade without paying taxes, blah, blah, blah. But we don't really have the ability to use it to fund things in the midterm of our life. So that's where brokerage accounts come into play. And how they work is you basically are taxed yearly on dividends, interest, and capital gains if you sell. So like if I buy Apple and I don't sell Apple this year, I'm not going to have any capital gains taxes. I probably will have some from dividends, which are going to be taxed at your income rate. But you just need to be aware of this bucket is money goes in post-tax, it gets invested, and you pay tax anytime that you realize a gain or realize interest or get dividends paid out to you. Mm -hmm. And like, as, as you're kind of like talking through that, like someone may think like, oh, well, these, the first two, they provide all the tax advantages. Like, why would I put any money in a taxable account like that just doesn't make sense but like usually like the most common reason is because you've maxed out like the the IRA or your 401k and it's like well then there's not really many tax advantage places to put your money so then it's yeah. like you can either go into a taxable account or you could start to diversify elsewhere like real estate whatever else um, but that's that's kind of why people um, do the taxable account and some yeah. people Kind of treat it like as their kind of meme stock just fun trading like get invested doesn't really affect retirement that much like that's just kind of yeah. gambling a little bit like that's just something to do for fun yeah i see them come into play if you maxed out your roth backdoor roth etc and you've at least hit the match of your 401k then you can start to think about the brokerage account of like, hey, maybe I plan to retire early. I have kids education. We might want like a vacation house. Like you're going to need to build up money that you can use there before you're 59 and a half. For some people, if their goals are not like that at all, and they're like, hey, I want to work late. I want to put as much money away retirement as possible. Then they might go max out their 401k or Roth 401k before they go to that taxable account. But you are right. Like at one of those two levels, depending on your goals is where you start to build that taxable account. But I also like to call it more so like your freedom account. This is the account that you're going to use to pursue the things that you want in life that you don't even know that you're going to want in the future because it's fully accessible. Um, and also like one thing that, you know, the rich do here is instead of paying capital gains, you can borrow against your taxable account as it gets larger. You can't necessarily do that if you have 50 or 100,000. It's really like 100, two, three above. You basically, without having to sell and pay tax, can borrow with that basically as your line of credit or basically it's like the credibility you have to show that you can pay it back but that's also something advantageous that i would say that the wealthy do yeah and you made a good point um with the the age because like i mean most retirement accounts they have the age limit of 59 and a half if you pull out money before that you're going to get taxed and penalized um which if you withdraw money from the taxable account you're going to owe taxes on that as well um, but like with, with a 401k, if you withdrew early, you would owe tax and I believe it's 10% penalty still. Um, and then one thing I want to point out, with, you say for the Roth, uh, just normal 401k. Oh yeah. Yeah. Normally then, you'll pay. Yeah. Yeah. And then that, yep. That was perfect. Cause with a Roth, like not saying that you should do this, but you can kind of view a Roth IRA, like as a glorified savings account a little bit, because you are 
putting in after tax dollars, you can withdraw your contributions without owing taxes or penalties since you already paid taxes on it. Um, which if you withdrew like earnings, like if you put in 500 and it grew to a thousand, if you withdrew the whole thing, then you would owe tax or yeah, owe taxes and um, penalty on the earnings, but not what you contributed. So just wanted to point that out real quick. Yeah, I think that's a very important distinction. So um, hope everybody found this as helpful. We walked through income tax, capital gains, the difference between short-term and long-term, why you need to understand them, tax credits, tax deductions, and also how different investment accounts are taxed. All of this is probably something that you're not going to be able to just review once. You're going to need to like reread this, go over it. Cause even like you see us, like every once in a while, we're like, wait, did we just say the wrong thing here? Cause there's so much to it. So that tax guide is going to be super helpful. If you go subscribe, you get the tax guide free. And then as Trayton said, this first one's going to be your insurance guide. And then we're going to have one to setting up an automated financial system, equity comp. Like we're going to just be pushing out every month, a really great guide that is going to be applicable for you. So thanks again for tuning in and listening. Um, we're glad to have all of you and we'll see you back next week.